What was different for you working on um, Momentary Relapse and working on Division Bell? Well, I have to pick you up there, Daniel. Don't call it momentary relapse. I, wow. Did I say relapse? <laughs> it's not my, relapse. my apologies. <laughs> Jeez. So, uh, yeah. Um, so what was the question? Again? Wow. I, I, I messed that one up. Uh, what was the difference between momentary lapse and uh, division bell? Um, well, I, uh, at the beginning, a uh, very very little although i was kind of orienting more towards perhaps rick and 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 working on that song wearing the inside out with rick in mind whereas perhaps earlier i've been more working closely with david but the main thing is that that pretty early on in the project whereas momentary lapse i was kind of like there from the beginning to the end um with with the division bell I, I kind of got pulled away um, pretty shortly after after it had started, probably, you know, 20% into the project. So it was a very different thing. I mean, it was, it was a shorter period of time. Um, it was less working on less, on a, on a narrower kind of spectrum. And uh, uh, so, I, I, you know, it was a, it was a different, slightly different kind of world, really. David was a. Uh, we we got on very well. I had a huge amount of respect for him. He was going through quite a rough time with uh, with with the band in the sense because of the whole kind of reconfiguring of Pink Floyd after post Roger. But he never he never offloaded his his crap on 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 anybody as far as I could see. He kind of soaked it all up and sailed on, very Buddha like somehow. And uh, and I went down to the boat. They were recording on a on a boat moored in the Thames. I remember taking kind of sampler uh, early sort of samplers, a bit of technology, field recordings, those things that Pink Floyd have been quite renowned for often incorporating sort of field recordings, whether it's Grandchester Meadows or Langley rowing down the River Thames. And I sat in on all the meetings pretty much, I think, with the, the at least the creative meetings, not the business meetings, but with Bob Ezrin, who was producing Momentary Labs. And uh, I, I was made to feel very uh, included in, in a rather wonderful way. Um, had a, a, perhaps a small part to play in some kind of conceptual discussions, planning, structure, you know, A, B, C, beginnings, middle endings, how could it be? But then moved on into a wonderful little gazebo in the garden. The boat is moored, um, as I told you, on the Thames, and uh, they'd moved the wonderful recording environment into the boat very carefully without actually disturbing any of the original features of this fabulous vessel, which was... Um, uh, uh, constructed around about the turn of the 19th to 20th century, so it was it was an ancient and beautiful craft, and uh, it it was moored at the bottom of a delightful garden, which you accessed via a secret tunnel, which was built by Capability Brown, who's a sort of a famous English landscape gardener and designer of of kind of uh, landscapes and so on. And in this garden, there was a, a little gazebo, sort of octagonal or hexagonal, perhaps, I can't remember, windows and a writing desk and the river flowing in front of me. And there I set to work on working on the lyrics for, for the album. <clears throat> and, uh, and most specifically, what, you know, through a process of I was going down there pretty much daily for about a year and a half, about 18 months. So we all got to know each other pretty well. And I got on very well with Rick as well and, and Nick. 
and um, the three songs that, that came out most strongly after various attempts at various tries and you know sketches and things it ended up with those three tracks um, on the turning away dogs of war and of course the single which was learning to fly mm -hmm. and um, that was an all an extremely rewarding experience and I, I really had a great time the um, friendship with Rick became quite strong and uh, as a result although I think actually in the chronology of things I think it was Division Bell that sort of started to they, they took momentary laps on tour I think we flew to Madison Square Gardens to watch them play that um, that was all very exciting as uh, Versailles incredible gigs in true Pink Floyd style and um, so that was all very kind of cool. And then Division Bell came up and I wrote this song specifically for Rick, really, Wearing the Inside Out, which um, I still really like that title for its ambiguity, sort of wearing something out in the sense that you kind of overuse it. And uh, so I like... You wear your insides out with too much analysis, <laughs> perhaps, yeah. or too much thinking about yourself and your problems. But, um, and then of course, you wear things out just well, whatever. You put your heart on your sleeve, it's another form of wearing your yeah. insides out, I guess. They were pretty happy with the way that mom mom momentary lapse was a kind of. A kind of a step into some sort of an unknown and it went so well that I think my view anyway is that Division Bell was approached with quite a quite a happy and confident sort of approach to it um no I think I think it all it all went well I got tangled up with a few other projects and and uh I kind of edged I, w I slowly kind of left that uh the Division Bell thing um i didn't see it through uh and david was w working with other people and so on and i was getting involved in writing operas uh i think and i can't remember but um wearing the inside out did make it onto the onto the division bell and i'm very proud of that song and rick and it was kind of written for rick and rick sang uh parts of it and so on and that resulted in me then going and spending another year and a half or so in the early 90s, I think it must have been, um, with Rick in his home studio where we, where, where we produced Broken China. We wrote it, produced it, planned it, recorded it, brought it back to the UK. And then, of course, it sort of was mixed with uh, Laurie Latham, who's a very old friend uh, of mine, wonderful, um, uh, uh, what I think you call a producer engineer. In other words, you know, somebody who can really cover the whole thing conceptually and technically. And um, and that, that was a really nice experience. And I'm proud of that work, too. That was that was broken China. Obviously, the Pink Floyd thing was life-changing as well, because I don't think anybody, uh, you know, everybody realizes that you know, a, a tiny, tiny slice of Pink Floyd will kind of set you up for decades. So, uh, on to be uh, perfectly honest and materialistic. Um, it was wonderful to have written a few songs with Pink Floyd because that sort of keeps me ticking over to this day. Although they're kind of gradual, the royalties are gradually shrinking. But um, no, that was a huge moment. But also actually not just the, well, the money was kind of important because it gives you the freedom to indulge in things that are not necessarily commercial. So you're not kind of under the constraint of having to 
you know, when you do an experimental work and you, I mean, if I can sort of stick, uh, you know, if I can support a company, a small company, independent company by, um, you know, putting 500 bucks into the pot towards pressing up some CDs or so on, that's great. And I, I you know, this, this became possible probably thanks to that situation. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe for more because there is a lot more to come. All the videos on my channel are original. I'm the one filming, editing, and conducting all the interviews. So if you guys like what you see and you want to support, the best way to do so is honestly just to subscribe. Thanks for watching.